All right. Uh, today we're going to talk about grace. And I was rather frustrated this week as I uh, prepared for uh, today's uh, uh, message simply because I started collecting information and materials and I ended up with uh, enough information that it was about the same thickness as a Sears and Roebuck catalog. <laughs> I, I just had so much information, so much good information that I wanted to share with you, but not enough time. And uh, you would probably end up getting bored with it. And I might not make it all the way through the sermon because it had lasted about six or seven hours. So what I've done is I've taken the first part of that material, uh, the grace of God in the Old Testament. And next uh, time that we're together and I'm preaching, I will uh, uh, attempt to talk about the grace of God in the New Testament. So uh, today, the grace of God in the Old Covenant, Exodus 34, 6, our very familiar verse. Then the Lord passed by in front of him and proclaimed, the Lord, the Lord God, compassionate and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in loving kindness and truth. And so uh, here we're talking about grace again, and we know that the an acronym G-R-A-C-E uh, stands for God's riches at Christ's expense. God's riches at Christ's expense. Grace is everything for nothing to those who don't deserve anything. And that's what grace is all about. Now, in Exodus 34, 6, uh, this uh, adjective gracious is hanun, and it's used only of God in the Old Testament. The word denotes an action performed by God on behalf of man. It's not merited by man. Rather, it's an action that's based upon and originates from the attributes of uh, the love of God. The word speaks of God's gracious policy. It describes God in imparting unmerited blessings to sinners. It's based upon the merits of the object of the sinner's faith. It's based upon God himself. Grace is all that God is free to do in imparting unmerited blessings to those who trust in Jesus Christ as Savior. I'm reading a book about the last times, and I just read a, a chapter, and the guy emphasized it again and again and again, that if you want to be able to interpret any scripture, you have to interpret it based upon the key to scripture, and that is the Lord Jesus Christ. Anything in the Old Testament, anything in the New Testament has to be interpreted in the light of Jesus Christ, the Savior. I had an Old Testament professor one time that said that you shouldn't mix the Old Testament and the New Testament, that you shouldn't bring New Testament scriptures to explain something in the Old Testament. Well, he only lasted one year, and uh, he went somewhere else because he didn't end up uh, staying at my seminary because uh, literally uh, we as evangelical New Testament Bible-believing Christians believe that everything is interpreted by Jesus Christ. And so whenever we think about this, grace is all that God is free to do in imparting unmerited blessings to those who trust in Jesus Christ. If you truly want to be able to interpret the Old Testament and or the New Testament, you have to belong to Jesus Christ to fully understand because the Spirit of God that lives within you is the one that illuminates this scripture for you. So uh, recognize that uh, this grace is an important thing. It's based upon the merits of Christ and his death on the cross. It's God treating us in a manner that we don't deserve and excludes any human works. No matter what you do, it doesn't matter. Grace is a completely different component. In order to uh, require eternal salvation or the blessings of God, 
grace means that uh, God saved us and blessed us despite of ourselves. And not according to anything that we do, but rather saved us and blessed us because of the merits of Christ and his work on the cross. It excludes any human merit in salvation and blessing and gives the creator all the credit and the creature absolutely none. Martin Luther said, we can't find God by ascending the ladder of love the ladder of merit, or the ladder of speculation. Instead, God must find us by descending to us on the ladder of grace. Remember that story in the book of Genesis about when Jacob uh, fled from uh, his brother because he thought his brother was going to kill him? And uh, so he was in the wilderness. He laid his head down on a rock and went to sleep. And he had a dream, and in this dream he saw a ladder that was uh, extending from heaven down to earth. But recognize that God didn't say to Jacob, come climb this ladder. The ladder was only for God's servants to descend to Jacob. And you know, that's what it's all about. Uh, my One of my favorite theologians, Donald Bloch, uh, said uh, about this passage and about uh, Jacob, he said, it's not a ladder of speculation or a stairway of merit that brings us to God, but it's the free elevator of grace. Listen, the only way that you can come up to Jesus is to get on his elevator. And you know what an elevator does? You get on the elevator, the doors close, and then it brings you up. And that's what it's all about here. That's what grace is truly all about. So uh, in John chapter 1, verses 16 and 17, Bob uh, talked about this a couple of weeks ago in our, our study of the gospel of John. Uh, John said, for of his fullness we have all received, and grace upon grace. For the law was given through Moses. Grace and truth were realized through Jesus Christ. And so a rough rule of thumb, the Old Testament is law. The New Testament is grace. But I want you to know that all through the Old Testament, we find instances of grace everywhere. It's not just the fact that you obey the law, but God was gracious enough even to give the law to the Israelites. But the important thing is this, that grace permeates all of the scriptures. Now, all the way back in the book of Job, you know, Job had these three guys that were, were uh, his, his uh, uh, people that were encouraging him, and uh, they, were, they were pretty sorry encouragers. But Elihu, one of those, uh, gives a, a wonderful uh, synopsis of Old Testament, Old Covenant kind of grace. And uh, it's one of the only places where Job and or God didn't uh, uh, criticize one of these three uh, uh, healers. And uh, here's what it says. Uh, Elihu says in Job 33, beginning with verse 31, pay attention, O Job, listen to me. Keep silent, let me speak. Then if you have anything to say, answer me. Speak, for I desire to justify you. If not, listen to me, keep silent, and I will teach you wisdom. Now, here's what he said. He has redeemed my soul from going to the pit, and my life shall see the light. Behold, God does all these oftentimes with men to bring back his soul from the pit that he may be enlightened with the light of life. It's all of God. Elihu said, it's all of God. God is the one that brings us back, even from death. And so uh, uh, that's grace. That's what grace is all about. Now, there's not just one word uh, like this rahum that we find in uh, Exodus chapter 34, but there's a number of words that, that uh, uh, really talk about this idea of grace in the Old Testament. Now, 
the important thing is, is not that we do a word study of all these words, and we might do that in the New Testament, but in the Old Testament, the important thing is to look at the narratives, because the narratives, the stories, are the things that teach us about Old Testament grace. And I have a number of these listed here. The first one, God's grace was launched, uh, uh, launched Noah's ministry. In Genesis chapter 6, it says, Then the Lord saw that the wickedness of man was great on the earth, and that every intent of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. The Lord was sorry that he had made man on the earth, and he was grieved in his heart. And the Lord said, I will blot out man from uh, whom I have created from the face of the land, from the man to the animals, to creeping things, and to birds of the sky, for I am sorry I have made him. But, verse 8 says, but Noah found favor in the eyes of the Lord. During Noah's day, wickedness was well nigh universal. God regretted creating mankind, and uh, that says that Noah, but Noah found favor in the eyes of the Lord. That's what it says in all the modern translations. In the King James Version, it says this, Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. It wasn't that Noah was a goody two-shoes or anything else, but Noah found grace because he looked to the Lord and believed in the Lord. That's grace. Grace is everything for nothing for those who don't deserve anything. God's grace trumped Abraham and Sarah's unbelief. And we all know the story of that. We know that uh, the first thing that uh, Sarah did when Abraham couldn't produce an heir, uh, she said, well, take my maidservant and have relations with her. And when, when the baby comes, I'll be right there and I'll receive the baby as if it were mine. And so that's exactly what Abraham did. He went into Hagar. They uh, had a child. And uh, uh, God said, no, that's not exactly what I wanted you to do. And literally, he is, he is uh, uh, saying to Sarah and to Abraham, you didn't believe me. You didn't trust me. And then whenever finally it comes around to the point and Sarah's in her old age and Abraham is even older, uh, the uh, uh, God comes and says to Sarah, this time next year, you're going to be bouncing your son on your knee. And what did she do? She laughed. She, she, it was a laughter saying, ha, that can't ever happen. And sure enough, in a year, there was a baby bouncing on her knee. And you know what she named that baby? Laughter. <laughs> That's what Isaac means. Laughter. But neither one of them really believed. And yet God was gracious to this couple. And so we, uh, we see that uh, even though they took matters into their own hands, even though they didn't believe, God remained faithful to his promise and provided an heir to Abraham and Sarah. Now that's grace. Grace that's everything for nothing to those who don't deserve anything. The third thing, grace gave Joseph the resources to preserve. Now, Joseph was kind of a troubling child. He, uh, he thought all of his brothers should treat him with more respect than anyone else. In fact, he even thought that his parents should. And uh, he was just an obnoxious uh, child. And so uh, doing what many brothers and sisters have wanted to do, they sold their younger sibling into slavery. And so he ended up in Egypt, and he, he got a good job. He was a slave in the household of one of the most important men in the entire country. But the problem came when Potiphar's wife thought she would seduce Joseph, and he was not seducible, but uh, she accused him of, of rape, and he was thrown into prison. And in prison, he uh, uh, told a bunch of uh, fellows their dreams, and and what they could expect. And finally, 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 he got to appear before Pharaoh, tell him his dreams. And Pharaoh said, wow, this is wonderful. I'm going to make you second in command of the whole country. And so uh, Joseph 
went from being an abject slave to becoming the second most powerful man in any civilized country at that time. And so uh, uh, absolutely, that's grace. Grace is everything for nothing to those who don't deserve anything. God's grace was on Moses for his entire life. We, we see the story of Moses beginning whenever uh, they said, kill all the Hebrew boy babies. And yet his, his parents put him in an ark, in a little basket covered with pitch so that it wouldn't sink. And they put him out in the backwaters of the Nile. Well, it, it just so happened that Pharaoh's daughter found that basket, took that child, and literally adopted that child into the royal family. And from then on, all the way through, if you study the whole uh, picture of Moses, you see that uh, God was in charge and was bringing grace into Moses' life his entire life. He was commissioned, finally, to deliver the Israelites in adulthood. That's grace. Grace that's everything for nothing to those who don't deserve anything. God's grace repeatedly rescued the rebellious Israelites. In the book of, of uh, Judges, we see that the Israelites would fall into sin and idolatry, and that God would uh, uh, become upset with them and send a, a, a person or a a savior, literally someone who would come in and rescue the Israelites, someone who would marshal their armies and rebel against the, the uh, people that had, uh, had uh, taken them captive. And we see that this would only happen when Israelites said, we've sinned and we repent and God would send relief for the Israelites. And it happened over and over and over again. God rescued, God forgave, God blessed the Israelites. That's grace. Even knowing, even knowing that those Israelites would again turn and sin. That's grace. Everything for nothing to those who don't deserve anything. God's grace completely transformed Rahab. Oh, listen, I want to do a sermon on Rahab because she is one of the, the great heroines of the, the Bible. In verse number uh, uh, two or 11 in chapter 2 of Joshua, it says, The Lord your God, this is what Rahab said, The Lord your God, he is a God of heaven above and on earth beneath. Here was, here was a foreign woman that said, God is God. And I'm putting my trust in him. And so uh, through a series of events, and you need to read her story because it really is a marvelous story. She confessed her need of, uh, for God to save her. Literally, she knelt as a harlot. And she rose as a daughter of the Most High God. What a beautiful story. You know, if you look at this, this prostitute, that now has become a heroine of, of the entire nation of Israel. God saves anyone with a past. He'll save you with your past. And not only will he save you with your past, he will use you with your past. And not only that, he will literally transform and redefine yourself away from that past. Rahab went from being a fallen woman to a chosen woman. She went from being a bad girl to a bride. She went from being a true mess to a wonderful mother, from a prostitute to a progenitor of the Messiah. In other words, she was literally the great, great grandmother of King David. And David, of course, Jesus is called often again, the son of David. What a beautiful story of Rahab. That's all grace. That's God's grace. Grace is everything for nothing for those who don't deserve anything. And of course, we also have to look at King David. 
God's grace completely forgave the lusty, thieving, adulterous, lying, and murdering King David. David confessed. David repented. David asked for forgiveness. God forgave. That's grace. That's what Psalm 51 is all about, isn't it? It's all about grace. Grace is everything for nothing to those who don't deserve anything. God's grace was revealed and prophesied when mankind first sinned. In Genesis chapter 3, we read about uh, the, the fall of man, the, the sin that was created. And even though they were ejected from the garden, even though they would taste mortal death, uh, in verse number 15, the Bible says, I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your seed and her seed. This is talking to our friend, the devil. He shall bruise you on the head and you will bruise him on the heel. That's grace. That's the first mention of grace in the Bible. Grace is everything for nothing for those who don't deserve anything. God's grace to Abraham and Isaac was made plain when God provided the ram in the place of Isaac. You know the story. Uh, God told Abraham, take your beloved son, Isaac, and take him to a far mountain, place him upon an altar, slay him, and offer him as a burnt sacrifice. What a terrible thought that a father would do that to his child. And so Abraham and Isaac both made this trip. Abraham doing exactly what God had told him to do, and Isaac doing everything his father told him to do. And at the last minute, just as, as Abraham had the knife ready to plunge into the breast of his beloved son, God said, whoa, wait a minute. And he turned around and he saw a ram in the thicket. And he went and grabbed that ram and I can, I can just see him grabbing that ram by the horns and placing that ram on the, the altar and together, father and son, sacrificing that ram instead of the son. What a beautiful, beautiful picture of grace. That's grace. That's grace. Grace is everything for nothing to those who don't deserve anything. God's grace is evident when he provided Boaz as the kinsman redeemer for Ruth and Naomi. You know that story too. Naomi had two uh, daughters-in-law. One of them, actually, uh, they were all widowed. Naomi, her two daughters-in-law, they were all widowed. But one of the widowed daughters-in-law, Ruth, came back to uh, Bethlehem with her mother-in-law. And they were destitute. They had nothing. But yet, she was related to Boaz. Naomi was related to Boaz. And so, uh, being old and not uh, ready to have children herself, she sent Ruth to actually come before Boaz and ask him to be the kinsman redeemer. It's kind of a Sadie Hawkins thing. Uh, we don't look at it that way, but actually it was Ruth proposing to Boaz. And Boaz, uh, the guy that said, where have you been all my life? I'm in love with you. I'll do anything for you. And so he became the kinsman redeemer. He became the husband of Ruth. And so in the fourth chapter, the 13th verse says this. So Boaz took Ruth and she became his wife and he went into her and the Lord enabled her to conceive. And she gave birth to a son. When the woman said to Naomi, blessed is the Lord who has not left you without a redeemer today. May his name become famous in Israel. May he also be to you a restorer of life and a sustainer of your old age. For your daughter-in-law who loves you and is better to you than seven sons has given birth to him. Isn't it wonderful that the end of that story says, and Naomi bounced the boy on her knee 
His name was Obed. And when he grew up, he fathered Jesse. And when Jesse grew up, he had a whole slew of sons. And the very last one was David, who became the king. The lineage of our Savior. Now, it's interesting also to note that Boaz had a mother whose name was Rahab. How interesting. That's grace. Grace is everything for nothing to those who don't deserve anything. God's grace was upon Nineveh when they repented from their wicked way. You know the story of Jonah. Jonah was told, go to Nineveh, tell them they're going to die. And of course, uh, Jonah said, yes, sir, and went directly in the opposite direction, got on a ship and got in a storm, was thrown overboard by the crew that didn't all want to die. And so a great fish came and swallowed him up and he was in the belly of that fish for three days. And finally, the fish got sick of him and vomited him up on dry land. And so Jonah said, oh, well, since all of this has happened, maybe I ought to go to Nineveh. And he said, then I'll get to see Nineveh destroyed. So he went to Nineveh, went through the city preaching, you're going to die. You're going to die. You're going to die. And the people thought, oh, and they repented. And God relented from his promise to punish Nineveh by destroying it. Now, of course, that made Jonah mad. We know that. But uh, all through it all, that's grace. God working in the lives of people. Grace is everything for nothing to those who don't deserve anything. That's grace. God's grace was realized whenever uh, he healed Hezekiah from a mortal illness. That story is found in 2 Kings, and Hezekiah was the king, and uh, he was doing some great works for God, but all of a sudden he became ill. It, it sounds like it was some sort of infection, and it, it was terminal. He was dying. And so Hezekiah prayed and said, Lord, I want to continue serving and working for you. And God relented and said, you have 15 more years of life. And so it was a wonderful blessing of God. You know, that's grace. Talk about the fact that God heals. There's your story. There's your proof text. God heals his people. For a while. And then ultimately he calls and says, I healed you for a while. Now it's time to come home for the complete healing. That's the way God works. And that's grace. That's uh, to those who don't deserve anything. That's true grace. God's grace protected Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, and Daniel. You see, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego were thrown into the fiery furnace. It didn't kill them. They walked around with a fourth man in the fire. Wonder who that was. I'll give you a hint. His name was Jesus, the fourth man in the fire. And they got out of the fire, and it says that they didn't even have the smell of smoke on their clothes. Daniel refused to bow down. And so the king threw him into a den of lions. And all night long, he was there in that den of lions who were ravenously hungry. And he came out full and complete the next day. That's grace. Grace is everything for nothing to those who don't deserve anything. Billy Graham tells a story about grace. He said that early in his career, he was driving uh, from one location to another location for one of his uh, uh, meetings, evangelistic crusades. And he, he drove through this town. He said, I was going a little bit fast. And so a policeman stopped him and uh, said, uh, you were exceeding the speed limit. And, you know, in some of those little southern towns, they, they were pretty sticky on uh, their laws. And so the, the guy said, well, listen, uh, you have to appear before the judge today. 
and pay your fine. And so uh, he took Billy Graham to the, the courtroom and the, the judge says, uh, guilty or not guilty? And uh, Billy Graham said, well, I'm guilty. I exceeded the speed limit and I'm sorry. And the judge said, that's too bad. You exceeded the speed limit and now you have to pay. And he kept looking at Billy Graham and finally he said, you're Billy Graham, aren't you? And he said, yes, your honor, I am. And so the judge said, your fine is $10, $1 for every mile over the speed limit. And he said, the judge said, and I'm paying it. And he reached under his robe and pulled out his wallet and slapped the $10 bill down on the, the thing and said to Billy Graham, your fine is paid. And then he took Billy Graham out and gave him a steak dinner. <laughs> and Billy Graham said, now that's grace. That's grace. It's totally undeserved. And it's a total, absolute blessing. I heard a story of a, a certain man, a rich man, whose son was uh, killed in the war. And uh, before the, the young man had went to war, uh, he and his father were great lovers of art. And uh, so uh, when he went to war, one of the things he did uh, shortly before he was killed in, in action, he had uh, made a little painting. And uh, so one of his comrades uh, after the war took that painting and took it to the father. And the father took that painting and put it beside all of these wonderful, beautiful, expensive uh, pieces of art and enjoyed it day by day. So when the father died, there was a great auction. They were, they were gonna auction off all of the paintings, thousands of dollars, maybe millions of dollars worth of paintings. But the first painting that was auctioned off was the son's little painting. And it wasn't great art. And so they put it up on the, the easel. There's one right there. But they put it up on the easel. And so people were looking at it and said, do I have a bid? No one bid at anything. And finally, one man raised his hand and said, I'll bid on the painting. And he said, well, how much? And he said, since no one else has bid, I'll give $10. And so they said, going once, going twice, going three times, sold. And said, who are you, sir? And he said, well, I was a servant in the household of the master. And he loved his son. And I loved his son. And so I bought everything of the son. And so the judge said, or the, the auctioneer said, okay, let me read this letter. It's from the deceased father. And the father said in the letter, whoever buys my son's painting, I give him all the rest of the paintings. I give him all my riches and all of my wealth because he loved my son. That's grace. That's what grace is all about. That's what God does for you and for me. Chuck Swindoll said that uh, in his book, Grace Awakening, if our greatest need had been information, God would have sent an educator. If our greatest need had been technology, he would have sent us a scientist. If our greatest need had been money, he would have sent an economist. If our greatest need was pleasure, he would have sent an entertainer. But our greatest need was forgiveness. So he sent his son as our savior. Grace, grace, marvelous, infinite, matchless grace, freely bestowed on all who believe you are longing to see his face. Will you this moment his grace received.